Good morning, everybody. Um, I guess I don't need to introduce myself because I just had a, a lovely introduction. So um, thank you all so much for being here, and I'm really excited to, to dig in to this topic with you. Um, I do want to throw out there first that since I am going to be discussing things around ethical design, sensitive topics are going to be addressed. And so I do want to throw a content warning out there. Uh, specifically, I'll be talking about mental health and mental illness, including symptoms, experiences, stigmas, things like that. Uh, I will be talking about death, in-game death specifically, um, with a special warning around death by suicide and child death. And I will be touching, talk, uh, touching briefly on in-game violence, um, specifically with gun violence and a tiny bit of terrorism. So just as a heads up on that. However, what will not come up, I will not be discussing anything in graphic detail and there will be no graphic depictions, even of the things that I said I'm going to talk about. Um, there will be no discussion or descriptions of things related to sexual violence, abuse, anything with reproductive health like pregnancy or common phobias such as needles or spiders. So uh, give everybody a chance. If you want to run now, I understand. Um, but if at any point you do feel uncomfortable, please do what you need to do to take care of yourself um, so that you can feel safe. All right. So <sighs> preaching to the choir, games make us feel things. Games are really, really good at making us feel things. This lovely wheel up here is the Wheel of Feels, um, and therapists like myself use it all the time. What you do is you start at the center to identify the general word for a feeling like, say, joy or surprise, and then you can branch out, and those are all the associated feelings that get a little bit more specific. Um, and although games too, tend to focus on the emotions on this bottom side of the wheel, which are like the happy, the triumphant, the joyful, um, they're actually really good at getting us to the other side of the wheel, the dark side of the wheel. Um, and this is where things like sadness and fear and guilt live. These are, are feelings that we don't normally associate with enjoyment or fun, um, but games bring us there anyway. So it's important to keep in mind that just because we feel something during gameplay does not mean that it's empathy. So games deliver lots of feels, and those that do evoke a lot of feels we often refer to as empathy games. We put that label on them. Um, but empathy is more than just experiencing an emotion. It requires a projective imagination into the thoughts and feelings of others. So I'm gonna break that down a little bit more. Empathy at its core is a complex biological and psychological process that allows us humans to live in harmony with one another and so we don't murder each other all the time um, as much as possible. It fosters social connectivity through our capacity to understand and to emotionally connect with someone else's experience. And this comes up a lot in games because there's a natural alignment between the structure of empathy at its core and the structure of games and things that are naturally afforded by them. So for example, games, like I said, are good at evoking emotions, especially unpleasant emotions that we tend to avoid uh, whenever possible. Things like you know, guilt and shame and grief. And in a game, if we're able to connect emotionally with a character or an experience, we can actually practice empathy. We can practice feeling those feels that we avoid. And so it's important to keep in mind that although experiencing, even if you experience empathy in a game, that's not going to necessarily make the change happen. Empathy is a precursor to positive change. It is not the end result. So when we're thinking about games for change in particular, if you are able to get your player to feel empathy, that doesn't mean they're actually going to act empathetically. But it's an important component that you have to have there before action can happen. Secondly, uh, empathy has two, two main parts. There are a lot of parts, but the two main ones are cognitive and affective empathy. Cognitive empathy is our logical, rational understanding of another person's subjective lived experience. And this is something we do all the time in games, where we take perspective and we understand what someone else is doing, where we imagine ourselves as that character, and that's become a walk a mile in someone's shoes. Um, and in games, that happens when we take on avatars or we engage in role play. Affective empathy is the feels. And it's when we have that shared emotional experience with what's going on on screen. And so not only do games give us this, um, this moment, this opportunity to feel, while experiencing emotions we typically would avoid, um, it allows us to observe, experience, and express a greater range of human emotion. So again, we avoid guilt and shame in life as much as possible, but in games sometimes we actively seek it out, which allows us to practice and experience the full breadth of human emotion. 
So I want to share a personal example of what it's like when the cognitive aspects of empathy and the emotional aspects of empathy come together to make feels happen. So last year I was playing What Remains of Edith Finch, and if you were in the room for the previous panel, you know exactly what game I'm talking about. Um, but if you don't, Edith Finch is this gorgeous game about the lives and deaths of members of the Finch family. You play through a series, series of short stories about the members of the family. And in each of these little vignettes, you play as that family member on the day of their death. And I was like, okay, cool, I can do this. This is, you know, this is feels, but you know, I'm a therapist, I like that kind of thing. Um, and I was fine until I got to Gregory, who's right there, a little, little pudding. Um, and if you know Edith Finch, you know exactly what happens here. Um, but if you don't, it's important to know that by this point in the game, you know that every story you play ends with the death of the family member, and that you, the player, are the cause of that death by your actions. And so when I went into the Gregory vignette, um, I remember saying, oh God, please don't make me do this. So for context, I have a two-year-old son who, just like Gregory, loves the bathtub, and he loves his rubber duckies. And this experience just hit way too close to home for me that I felt so much anxiety, so much dread, and literally thought I might vomit. I couldn't push the button. I could not progress the game. And if not for handing my controller off to someone else, I never would have been able to finish the game, which would have been a shame because it's an amazing, beautiful, beautiful game. Um, I do wanna say for the record, my son is totally fine. <laughs> um, he's adorable, he's almost three. We're definitely in the three-nager stage. Um, <laughs> And so I, I wanted to use this as an example of a way to really intensely emotionally connect with a story, even without having that trauma in my life, um, because it's what we refer to as being empathically overloaded. So when we're digging up feels, we can become overwhelmed by those feels. And so for me, what that meant was shutting down. I handed the controller off, I got up, I left, I could not watch it. I was able to come back to the game, but I was done. Um, for someone else who may have a personal experience or connection to that kind of trauma, not only could that be emotionally triggering, it could possibly be re-traumatizing. And so this is why we need ethics um, when we're designing these kinds of experiences, because we don't want to hurt anybody. At least I don't, I don't think any of us want to hurt anybody. That is not my next slide. <laughs> ready for tech support. On my screen, it was different, so it was confusing. Um, so yeah, for me, it meant shutting down, and for someone else, it could be possible re-traumatization. I do want to be very clear. I think games can and absolutely should explore these kinds of difficult and emotional topics. Unpleasant emotions like sadness and grief and guilt are core to who we are as human beings and our experience, and we'd all be better served if we actually embraced them and talked about them rather than burying them and putting them in a dark place that we never experienced. That said, if we're going to play in the sandbox of the psyche, we have to take personal responsibility for what we're putting out into the world. And the psychological well-being of your players, <laughs> game switch. <laughs> it's a game thing. It, yeah, it's a game thing. This is um, not a bug, it's a feature. <laughs> it gives you a chance to <laughs> time check. Um, Hopefully we're good now. Yes, okay. Um, so yes, it's your, our duty as designers to consider the psychological state and well-being of the people who are engaging in our, the games that we're playing and to put up guardrails when we're provoking emotions and experiences that we know are powerful and can have potential impact. <coughs> so, central to any ethics code that exists, does anybody know who this is? No, this is Dr. Isaiah Friedlander. He's the therapist in Grand Theft Auto. He is incredibly unethical, which is I was funny. Um, yeah, he like extorts his client. It's, it's uh, not a great representation, but he's the antithesis to an ethics code. Um, but the core to any ethics code is the idea of non-malfeasance. That's the Hippocratic Oath of do no harm. 
But when we're designing in these spaces, because of the interactive and immersive nature of games, we need to do more than that. It's not just not doing harm, we need to actively do well by our players. So I'm gonna leave this up there. Let everybody take a picture. Very important, probably the most important slide in the entire deck. Informed consent. Informed consent is when the player is made fully aware of the potential harm or consequences of their participation. You see this across ethics codes, whether it's mental health, medical, LARP. LARP has an ethics code that involves informed consent as well. Informed consent is important because a player has a right to know what they're in for. Otherwise, they can't actually give you informed consent. So, after science, not a good, actually a very good example of informed consent because it tells you exactly what's going to hurt you. So, good job. One way to kind of an, an actually easy lift to get at informed consent is the idea of a content warning, which is I know nothing new, nothing flashy, but I'm really tired of bad content warnings, and so I wanted to show you guys what a good one, could be better, but a good one looks like. So first off, this is the content warning from Hellblade, Son of a Sacrifice. This is a game that was put out by Ninja Theory two, two years ago now, um, and it deals around um, issues of psychosis. So first up, hooray, there's a warning. There are lots and lots of games out there that have triggering content that don't have warnings on them. So it's just this is a win right here, and it's in the game. It's important to emphasize that because in a space like Games for Change, a lot of times there will be a poster telling someone what's in the game, but it's not in the game itself. And as someone who was pulled into a VR experience, had no idea what they were getting into, and then had a, what I would call, a triggering experience happen, please put them in your games. Second, it specifically calls out what could be problematic. A lot of times content warnings are like, there's violence. That could mean a lot of different things. So being specific is good. It also tells you who is going to be most vulnerable. So in this case, this persons who have um, similar experiences to those experienced of uh, uh, cinema and psychosis. And so that's important for if we're sharing this, if we want to use it in a classroom per se, that kind of stuff. It also has information, not just like, oh, if you're in distress, call this helpline. That's great, but again, that's kind of like the do no harm and we want to do better. And so this link takes you to, you can learn more about psychosis, you can learn more about resources and actually really help somebody in that space. And then last but not least, it calls out additional content that might be upsetting. So this is an example of something violent scenes, that's kind of vague. The scenes in this game are incredibly disturbing, um, and so I do wish that they had pulled out a little bit more. And one thing that could have made this uh, content warning even better is if there was active assent by the player. This pops up on your screen and then it fades away into the game. If you went to the bathroom, you would have missed it. And so active assent um, is, is important to have there. I wish they just added that in. So I'm going to give a content warning because we're gonna talk about Life is Strange real quick specifically around Kate and uh, death by suicide. So throwing that out there, because that should never be a surprise. So a game that could have really used a content warning was Life is Strange. Um, there are several instances in this game with very problematic content. And I mean problematic not in that the developers shouldn't have done it, but rather they should have warned people or given them the option to opt out of it. So in this one, there's a friend of the main character who, based on your choice as a player, either does or does not commit suicide. I'm sorry, does or does not die by suicide. Do not say commit suicide, that's bad. Die by suicide is, is the correct way to say it, I apologize. Um, and there was a lot of feedback on this about, you know, should there be a content warning? And I, I saw this exchange on a, a Reddit forum. Someone was asking, should Life is Strange have a trigger warning? And the response widely was, well, no, because that scene would lose its impact if you knew it was coming. No, <laughs> just no. Trauma is not a plot twist. It is not an Easter egg. It is someone's very real lived experience and needs to be treated with care. Another thing we can do as we are designing our game is this idea of being able to skip content. And I did not think I would be talking about Call of Duty Modern Warfare 2 at Games for Change about empathy and good ethical design, but here we are. <laughs> so Modern Warfare 2 has a very famous uh, chapter or scene called No Russian, where the player is undercover as a uh, Russian operative and engages in acts of terrorism or has the opportunity to like gun down an airport full of innocent people, which is really problematic. And at least the team decided that a content warning would be good, so hooray that that's there at the start of the game. Problematically, it says disturbing and offensive. What does that even mean? 
I have no idea. I cannot give you informed consent because I don't know what you're asking of me. But A plus, total A plus ACEs, is that you don't lose, you're not penalized for opting out. Like if they had put achievements in this section, you might have people going through it who didn't want to because they wanted the achievement. So in this way, it's not coercive. You really can opt out without any kind of retribution or punishment, which if anybody does research design, you know that is core to informed consent, is that the person knows that they can opt out without any fear of retribution or punishment. And then they did this, and I, that's just bad. You know, like, oh yes, ask me later, or no, I'm a triggered snowflake, and like it's, it's icky, so don't do that, that's bad. So that's stuff in game that we can do right now. What I also wanna leave you with are some questions that I hope keep you up at night if you are deciding to create these experiences that evoke these kinds of really uncomfortable emotions. So these happen at all points, before, during, and after the development process. The first one is, is there a risk of harm? I think sometimes they're like, no, 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 it'll be fine. So if you like, wouldn't show it to your grandma or you know, someone who had lived that experience without giving them a warning, there's probably a risk of harm. And so you just need to be real about that. And it doesn't mean you can't do it, it just means you need to be cognizant. If there is a risk, is the risk justifiable? Is there no other way to get at the message you're trying to get across? I know a lot of times when we do Games for Change, we do it really on the nose. Um, I'm not calling out any games because they're all wonderful, but let's say there was a potato crisis in Ireland. Let's pick that. We would make a game about the potato crisis in Ireland to get someone to feel empathy for it. We don't have to do that. We can abstract. The whole point of empathy is that we don't need to have that experience to feel those same feelings. So if you are using something that's really on the nose, really graphic, or very similar to real life, think about is this risk justified and is there another way that I could get at that same experience or understanding? Something that's really helpful to, as a guidepost, is would your players be happy in hindsight with what had happened to them? With that VR experience that I went through, no. I was very not happy that I went through that experience. And had I known what it was, I would not have gone through it. Yay, informed consent. So just thinking again, not about what we want as designers, but really putting the needs and the well-being of our players first. <coughs> And then also asking yourself, what are you doing to manage risk? Again, are we abstracting? Are we taking it a little bit further away so that there's a little more space to breathe with the content? If we're at a space like Games for Change and you have a game that you're showing that has a, a potential, has risk, what are you doing in that space to make that space safe? Do you have anybody on, on, on standby that knows crisis management? What if somebody has a panic attack because they played a game? I mean, it will almost never happen. And I hope that it never does happen. But one of the ways you manage risk is by thinking about those worst case scenarios and then adjusting for them. Another thing to keep in mind in this particular space is that it is very public. And if someone's gonna go through something that they might find upsetting, are they really gonna take the VR headset off in the middle of the game? Probably not. The social demands that are on us psychologically and socially speaking to behave a certain way in a certain setting, put that pressure on us to, to go through the whole thing and tell the person, yeah, you did a good job on that game. So keeping that in mind is um, very important. And that is it. And so it looks like I have a minute and 40 seconds um, for questions. But thank you all so much um, for coming.